Stormycast, episode 249 from Monday, January 23rd, 2012. Schrodinger's Cat. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evansville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing really good. Uh, once again, for everyone listening, we are recording this episode of Astronomy Cast as a live Google Plus Hangout, and the big innovation that we've got this week is one, a commitment to a schedule, I think, <laughs> yeah. which is important. So we're going to be recording Astronomy Cast usually uh, on Mondays at 12 noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, and 8 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time, yeah. UTC. So, so if you want to try and catch the recording live, that's approximately the time that we're going to be doing it. Although, we'll, you know, Depending There'll on be occasional much. Wednesdays when I'm traveling. Wednesday, yeah, your travel schedule. If we're going to try and get shows done ahead of time to match it. So that's the plan. Um, and, but the other cool thing is that we've now got a, a page dedicated at CosmoQuest, which is... Um, the, well, you can, we can explain that separately, but, but at cosmoquest.org slash hangouts. And so what's really cool about that is that you can then go to that page and you can, you know, just a few minutes before the show is going to start, and then when the show starts, it should just appear in that window, and then you can actually watch the show. So hope, we're hoping that we can try and minimize the amount of, of missing the show or people wondering where it's going on or they missed the when it started or all of that. We're trying to sort of make it as regular as, as possible now, now that we have access to Hangouts on air. Now, Pamela, do you, I don't think we've really gone into CosmoQuest, so did you want to take a second and just sort of explain the short version? Because I know you, you would take an hour to do this, so give us the short so, version. So, so the short version is, for, for a couple of years now, Fraser and I have talked about building a community where people are working on doing astronomy, learning astronomy, and basically recreating the idea of an academic learning research environment, a university basically, but for everyday people working at home in their spare time. So we've talked about uh, figuring out how to get telescope time. We've talked about uh, pie in the sky, getting our own satellite. Um, allowing you to basically become part of the science team for Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and we are also working with the MESSENGER mission, the DAWN mission, and the Space Telescope and we are going to be providing you things like this show streamed live, uh, star parties, and ways to do science that gets published and is actually really useful and needed by the scientific community. Yeah, it's really our belief that regular people who are interested in science, uh, who haven't necessarily gone and gotten their astrophysics degree and their PhD, can still contribute to science in meaningful ways, in identifying objects, in classifying things. And even, you know, with small telescopes and some of the amazing amateur telescopes, gathering uh, light from variable stars, searching for supernova. There's a ton of things that, that regular people can do to get involved in, in actual astronomical research. And so we're trying to develop tools that will bring the researchers together with the public to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to participate in science. And if things work out well, maybe we'll be able to actually change some of the ways that, that science gets done. So I think and it's pretty exciting. And the way science gets learned, no longer do you have to sign up for the $1,000 a credit or more university classes. We're going to be providing you classes right here on CosmoQuest as well. Yeah. So again, great big experiment. And, uh, you know, it'll take us a while to figure all the pieces out. But, but if you want to join us, uh, you can go to CosmoQuest.org and you can actually sign up and you can see some of the tools that we already have. What do we have right now? We have the moon mappers. We have Moon Mappers is live. Uh, we have wikis in place, but not yet populated with content. To um, the, the goal is to get information on how to reduce NASA image data. Uh, we have lots of content. We have a blog. We have a forum. Um, and if you have ideas for what you want to see, get on the forum and tell us what you want to yeah. see, and we'll work to make it happen. Yeah, but the big one, I mean, with the Moon Mappers, people can actually classify objects on the moon and that's used by researchers. So this, right. is, this is some real science happening here. And, and the other thing that's most important is with moon mappers you can fix the output of computer algorithms. So what we're trying to do is determine what is the most effective way to map the moon. Computers, humans, or some combination of both. And you can be one of those data points that helps us figure this out. There you go. All right, well let's get on with today's show. Uh, 
but you'll be hearing a lot more about Cosmic Quest as we uh, sort of flesh it out more. All right, so you've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat, that strange thought experiment designed by Erwin Schrodinger to show how the strange predictions of quantum theory could impact the real world. No cats will be harmed in the making of this episode, maybe. Uh, <laughs> There are no cats near me. Fraser may have a cat. Have it's a up cat. to him to harm a cat if any cats are going to yeah. get harmed. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> maybe. It's uncertain. It's uncertain what will happen in this multiverse. Uh, all right, so, so then where do you want to start? Well, let's just start with the sort of the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment as sort of initially described by Schrodinger. What, what, what was the, how did you describe it? Um, so the, the best way to describe it is a thought experiment designed to mock a uh, scientific concept. A lot of people really struggled with quantum mechanics while it was being developed. And in fact, a lot of people still struggle with quantum mechanics. And the, the What do they say? Those who, those who say they understand quantum mechanics don't understand quantum mechanics? Something like that. Yeah. Um, so so Schrodinger came up with, with the thought experiment of, so you've got a cat, a nice, big, tangible object. You put it in a box. You can't see inside the box. You can't hear what's inside the box. Cat is now in a box. You assume that it can breathe, it can eat, it can do all the cat-like things it needs to stay alive under normal conditions. But then you put with the cat something that undergoes... Uh, a quantum process, in this case radioactive decay, and all quantum processes are described through probabilities. And one of the ideas of quantum mechanics is until you observe something, it's in all the probability states at once. So if you have a material and you're not sure if it's decayed or not, well until you look at it, it has both decayed and not decayed. And this idea that something can be in multiple states at once led Schrodinger to basically say mockingly, and this was all meant mockingly, the cat is both dead and alive inside the box. And, and um, what's great is what started out as a way of scoffing the idea has since turned into the way we describe it. Well, so let's unpack that a bit then. I mean, when we say that the cat is both dead and alive, that particles decay and don't decay, what is the sort of quantum theory that's underpinning all of that? So in, in this case, we're talking about the probabilities tied to radioactive decay. We could just as easily be talking about the quantum probabilities that a given atom will be in a specific energy level. Lots of different things right. are... Right, photons are, going through the slit experiment. Right. So lots of different things are guided by a probability. And the, the thing is, you can't know a priori. You can't know ahead of time which atom is going to behave in which way. And because it's probabilities, there's always the chance nothing's going to behave in a certain way. So imagine the radioactive uh, isotope polonium-210. This is an, an isotope that periodically gets used to murder people because it, it has a 138-day half-life. It gives off a whole lot of energy uh, in the process of decaying. It, it's, it's rather potent stuff. Now, if you happen to have, say, about 280 atoms of this on any given day, one of those atoms should decay. And after 138 days, well, half of those atoms should have decayed. But that's a probability. It's only a probability. So it could be none of them ever decay. It could be all of them spontaneously decay. It could be that they go off in drips and drabs where 20 decay in one day, zero decay in the next several days. It's all defined by probabilities. And according to, to quantum mechanics, until you observe what happened, everything has happened. And all of those different possibilities coexist at the exact same time until the observation is made. So how, that, that's the weird part, right? I mean, you can take it back to that cat idea and you put the cat in the box and you've got particles that decay. And, but but what, is the, what is this process of, you know, until you observe it? How, you know, what, is that, what does that mean? Until you observe it, you don't know that the thing has happened? So with quantum mechanics, stuff, um, atoms, cats, uh, particles of, of all different types, 
exist in, in wave functions. And all of these different wave functions are said to be interacting with one another. And it, if you've ever been in a room with really awesome acoustics, you've walked around maybe speaking or humming to yourself, trying to find that sweet spot in the room where all of the echoes come back and add together to increase your voice, or walked around looking for that place that when you hum, you hear no echoes coming back. Well, what you're hearing is all the waves interacting with one another. Well, in quantum mechanics, you have all the different wave functions for all the different possible things that can happen. And they're all resonating together. But you don't actually hear, are they growing? Are they killing one another off? You can't hear the result until you listen, until you make the observation. So all the possible outcomes, the echo that builds the sound up, the lack of echo that is the dead spot in the room, all those possibilities simultaneously coexist in the wave function. And it's through making the observation that you determine how the waves at this particular moment have collapsed down into reality. And when you say making an observation, what are the kinds of things that you can do to make an observation? Well, so with, with an atomic uh, radioactive decay, you look to see which atoms are in which state. Um, so it's, it's literally a matter of looking to see uh, so how much of the polonium-210 has decayed into lead-206. And so it's in that atom counting stage that you make the observation. Or alternatively, you can have a detector for alpha particles. These are the high energy helium nuclei that get flung off in the radioactive process. So you can look for that he helium nuclei flying off. And that's another way of making an observation. Or for the cat, you open the box. Right, OK. And so then, and then as Schrodinger sort of originally described his experiment, I mean, what was the the pieces of the puzzle that he that he sort of in his joke, I guess, the way he put it together. Because I know it's kind of morphed into other things since then, right? So, so for Schrodinger, the idea was you take a cat, a healthy, nice cat, you put it in a box that will generally preserve its life, and you put in the box with the cat something radioactive that is going to undergo a radioactive decay, and you put with it something, a Geiger counter, some manner of detecting the radiation that is given off during that decay process in there with the cat, and you attach to that decay detector a vial of poison. And the second the detector detects a decay, it releases the poison and the poison kills the cat. So the idea is that the entire, si the entire system is one convolved set of wave functions where at any given moment, the wave functions that describe all the different possible states of all the different possible atoms are causing the cat's wave functions to be in states of dead or alive all at the same time, that it all gets entangled together until someone external observes the system and goes, cat is dead, therefore detector detected uh, nuclear decay process, therefore something decayed. Now, the reality is the cat does observe its own death. It, it knows when it died, or the autopsy will determine that. Right. Um, but it's still one of those, oh, that's kind of freaky kind of, kind of things. So before the observation was made, but I guess that's the point, right, is the cat made an observation. Right, right. Right? But, <clears throat> but, in, but I guess that's the way the thought experiment is going, that before the experimenter opens up the box and takes a look to see how the, the wave has collapsed, the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. Right. And, and this applies to lots of different systems. So you have it applying for radioactive decays. You also have this applying to the distribu distribution of atoms in different energy states. So for instance, if you grab um, a neon open sign, uh, it's not always filled with neon gas, but this tube of gas that glows red, green, whatever color it is that it glows when it says open, 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 the individual atoms in that aren't all at the exact same energy state all of the time. And there's an equation called the Boltzmann equation that looks at the temperature of the gas, looks at the density, looks at a lot of different things, and says, 
how many of the atoms are going to be in each of the different energy states. But it doesn't say which atom is in which state. So you have to observe the individual atoms to get at, OK, did you fall into this probability? Did you fall into this probability? And, and so there's all these different things that follow probabilities, but we can never say which atom behaves in which different way. But how is it different practically from the thought experiment? I mean, I know that, that if you put a cat into a box and did this experiment for real, I mean, one, you get a call from PETA, but two, <laughs> you would... Yeah, don't do this. You experiment. don't do this, but you, it also wouldn't work well, for real. So, so the for real pr problem is... Um, while all the atoms do have all these different states, the fact that you have the detector there making the detection means you know whether or not something happened. And that detector is making the detection. Now, one of, one of the interesting things, there's a quantum mechanics paper a few years ago that basically said simply by being in existence and observing our univer universe, we're changing the quantum state of the universe just by observing it. And every time we observe it, we reset the probabilities on different things. So at a certain level, we're not entirely sure where this breaks down and where it doesn't. We just know that things are dictated by probabilities and that observing things screws them up. And so then what is the, I guess, what is the actually going on? Like, I mean, this, is, this was designed, this thought experiment was designed to, to highlight how weird quantum <laughs> mechanics is. But what are the implications for, for this thought experiment and in sort of quantum mechanics itself? I mean, Well, what, one of the interesting things is you can actually um, use this to look at how light changes as you pass it through a variety of different polarizers. So uh, you can take a beam of light and pass it through a filter, and all of the light downstream from it should have a given polarization. But you can reset the probabilities through the stream as you go. And it, it, there's lots of creepiness that creeps in. The other thing is you can send atoms or electrons or uh, just individual photons of light through a single slit. And as they go through the single slit, their positions where they land, um, they, they move around and land in different places based on um, the assumption that they go through as a whole stream. And the most likely place they're going to land due to interfering with one another is in the center of the screen. But those interference patterns cause them to also sometimes go off to the left, go off to the right, and build up this what's called a fringe pattern, uh, interference pattern. Now, the thing is, you get the exact same pattern if you send 10,000 photons through as if you send one photon through at a time 10,000 times. So somehow, and we're not quite sure how, the photons, the electrons, the atoms, I think this has actually been done with buckyballs now, Yeah, they know what their probability distribution is. And it's like they interact with all of those atoms and molecules or whatever that haven't gone through yet. And, and so the universe is simply proving it's weird over and over and over again and allowing us to know all these wave functions are out there waiting to interact with one another. There's a couple of shows that we've actually done in the past that people might find interesting. We've done a whole episode just on entanglement, which is, I think, what you're talking about here. We've also done one on quantum mechanics, and we've also done one on multiverses. But I think it's multiverses that there's a lot of really interesting overlap with the Schrodinger's cat experiment and, you know, what could be a possible <laughs> explanation, a way to, to resolve it, right? Yeah. So, so trying to understand what exactly does this mean uh, leads to a lot of, well, head scratching, uh, a lot of hair pulling as well, and occasionally students crying over their homework assignments. Uh, one of the interpretations of this is what you're actually seeing is when something passes through a slit, it takes every possible option and it's interacting with itself. Um, Another way of looking at it is through all the different multiple universes that might be out there. We don't know if we're a single universe or one of many universes. 
um, every possibility is being realized. So in one reality, the photon goes straight through and hits in that most probable sweet spot. In another universe, it goes through and goes all the way to the left. So every possibility is being realized. And it's just a matter of, well, which universe are we in? And what we see just depends on the flip of the coin of which reality it is. Now, this means that um, on a macroscopic reality, if I woke up this morning and got out of bed, I could have simply did as I did and actually stand on the floor and make it out of my bed and out of my bedroom. But in another reality, I might have put my feet on the dog getting out of bed and had the dog explode and landed on my butt and had to be taken away in an ambul ambulance. Um, everything that could happen does happen in a universe, in this multi-universe, is another argument of quantum mechanics. And I guess to take it back to Schrodinger's cat, the, the cat in one universe is alive and in another universe it's dead. And, and this leads to the one um, possible way of testing if we're in a multiverse or not, which no one should ever do. And, and this is the suicidal scientist experiment where you put a scientist in a box instead of Schrodinger's cat and there's going to be some universe where the rules of probability are such that well while half of those atoms should decay in a half-life that doesn't mean any of them necessarily are going to and there's this infinitely tiny probability that if you put someone in a box with radioactive material none of it is going to decay as it's supposed to it's an infinitesimally small probability. But that means there's some universe out there where you put that scientist in a box with the polonium-210 with its 138-day half-life and 138 times five days later, still nothing has decayed. That scientist is still alive. And that means that that scientist is in the one universe that beat the odds that did that tail end of the probability distribution. And that means every other universe, though, that poor schmo is dead. So don't do this experiment. But it's the only way that we've come up with to test the multiverse theory. And so have other thought experiments been, been put together? I mean, the, you've got that one of the suicidal scientists. Are there <laughs> other, ex, other thought experiments sort of in the same vein as Schrodinger's cat? Well, well, those are the, the main ones. I mean, it, at a certain point, you start getting into quantum entanglement, which we've done shows on as well, where you start looking at, okay, these two things both were emitted in the same experiment. That means that if this one has these set of states, this one has to have this set of states in order for the properties to be conserved. Let's observe them switch and, and see if we can prove that these suckers... Um, stay tied together and, and so then we start getting to actually messing with the universe and it stops being thought experiments and starts actually being let's shoot photons of light down fiber optics as far as we can to see if we can keep two different photons entangled for as long as possible. And, and we can. And we can. Yeah, yeah, not we. Obviously, well, yeah, other people. With the, with, with the, I uh, just read the, the papers. Particles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it's really amazing because as much as uh, people dislike quantum mechanics, and what's strange to me is we get letters all the time from people saying relativity is wrong. Relativity is wrong, but, yeah. But, but we don't <coughs> get the same ones for quantum mechanics. Instead, we get the quantum mechanics is my religion. And, and I'm not quite sure why people get upset about quantum mechanics making their stomach and their head hurt but then embrace it as religion whereas people uh, find relativity makes their stomach hurt and their head hurt and therefore they reject it and come up with alternative non-mathematical theories. But for whatever reason this weirdness, this probability distribution way of describing the universe is readily embraced by a lot of people out there as well it's, it's just the probabilities that I had a bad day. Yeah, we call you know what is it quantum woo when a person yes. uh, when a person takes sort of quantum theory and embeds it in their own alternative theories about how the uh, about how the universe works. Deepak Chopra does that a lot. Yeah, there there are a lot of people that try and use quantum mechanics to to justify belief in things like telepathy. Um, <laughs> and yeah, no, we we reject that concept. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. That's, uh, I, I think that's one of those topics that we get 
ton of email about people wanting us to explain it. And I wonder why people find that, this thought experiment, so fascinating. The idea of a cat that is both dead and alive is just visually awesome. And sometimes all you need is that thought experiment that has a cool visual, like the twins that age differently from general relativity. You just need that cool visual that goes on a t-shirt. And so I guess if you, you know, you're a physicist and you want your theory to last into the future that everyone's going to reference, you've got to figure out a way to really make it pop. Really, a you know. a great thought experiment with a great cartoon sketch. Yeah, then you're then you're set. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela, and we'll talk to you. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, Fraser. Talk to you later. Now, don't leave. We're just saving our files. Save. Save again. <laughs> I'm exit GarageBand. Exit GarageBand. And we'll start answering your questions as soon as we're done staring at our <coughs> computers. Good. I'm safe. Yay. I, was, I, I wasn't sure about how, how much we would want to do because there's a lot of overlap from some of the other episodes. So. Yeah. <coughs> um, all right. Okay, opening all the different windows. Huh, okay, so I apparently, the comments at some point stopped refreshing. Okay, so, so I will post a link to the Hangout in the list of comments. So okay. just, again, just to be clear, what this is going to do is this is going to be a link if you wish to join the Hangout. Uh, and we'll, you know, and then ideally you're going to as ask us a question and then we'll be able to answer it and hang out with you. It doesn't have to be about Schrodinger's cat or quantum mechanics. It can be anything related to space and astronomy that, that you've got, which, or, you know, or just hang out with us. Uh, but ideally, you know, you'll interact with us as opposed to just jumping in and just listening quietly. But now remember that if you do jump in, that you're being broadcast live with us. Yes. So you have to be okay with the fact that seven people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, if you are watching this, if you can plus one it, that would be awesome, and then we can sort of find out how many people are watching. Uh, right now I see 63. So, um, And then go ahead and, and post any questions you want into the comments or on the Twitters, and we will, we will try and answer them. So if you want to add, post it on Twitter, what do they do? Do they, they use this CQX? Yeah. Um, pound CQX, pound Hangout. Right, but just the CQX. Who else is doing CQX right now? That's true. Will that get pulled into this list of... No, currently it only pound, pulls in when you have both CQX and pound Hangout. So right. I was trying to differentiate it so that you don't have to see all the stuff going on on CosmoQuest. Okay. Right, I see what you're saying. Okay. That and uh, I wanted to spang, spam everyone who was, who was posting on the Hangout tag. Okay. Well, I, um, so I've put in... Uh, I've, so I've posted a link to the Hangout into the chat and so into the comments on this thread. So if anybody wants to join us, they can. Uh, if not, we will just start grabbing their questions as we go. And what's awesome is, is I'm getting to find random small bugs that make no sense in my code. So David Price posted a comment with a link that seems to have stopped all other comments dead from making it to the Hangout site. So I will have that fixed by Thursday. Hi, Sam. Hello. How's it going? Great. Where are you located? Uh, I'm in San Francisco at the moment. I can tell by the accent. Uh, what, sort of a British Kiwi accent, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you have a Twitter shirt on. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, this is a gift. <laughs> cool. So, did you have a question for us? Um, I did. I posted it in the comments. Um, I'm really interested about um, Wheeler's, uh, what was it called? Wheeler's thought experiment, uh, which is where you, it's just sort of like shredding this cat, but over um, hundreds of millions or even billion year um, distances, and I was wondering if that was a still a, you know, a current question on the edge, or, you know, whether it's been confirmed, anything like that. So this is the delayed choice experiment, and I'm just pulling it up uh, to make sure I, I'm <coughs> not talking about the wrong thing. So I, I think this ties in 
with an experiment that was done at Harvard a few years ago that people are still trying to figure out. So the idea is you pass light through a slit and then you can do stuff to it. And, and in the process, uh, you don't necessarily get the interference patterns right away. And so the question is, if there's this gap in time and this gap in what the photons experience between going through the interference pattern, the, uh, sorry, between going through the slit and being detected on the screen, uh, does the photon change its mind? And this is one of those things that is still getting argued about because one of the strange things that, that has been delightfully observed is if you take, um, in this case it's a double slit experiment, you send, this has been done with electrons as well as with light, you send it through the double slit, you'll get an interference pattern on the screen which has a variety of bright and dark stripes down the screen. Now it's possible to take very thin wires and put them between the slits in the screen and those very thin wires, because they're in the places that appear dark on the screen, have absolutely no effect on what you see. Now if you put a lens in the system so that you have these sets of wires um, and a lens that would normally focus the light so that with the lens you have light coming through the slits and you get two bright splotches from the slits, um, the lens causes you to actually, you'd think, be able to see where the wires are. But the weird thing is if you cover up one of the two slits, then you see the wires through the bright pattern of the one slit. But if you have both slits there and the lens there and the wires there, then you don't see the patterns from where the wi wires are. This is a really confusing experiment because it seems to imply that the particles are acting like, well, particles when they go through the lens. They're behaving in particle ways, getting bent and refracted by the lens but they're also acting like waves, interfering with one another and not seeing the wires. Hmm. And so some people are arguing that this experiment says, well, something can beha behave as a wire, not as a wire, as a particle and a wave simultaneously. Other people are arguing, no, it's taking turns. And this has led to the entire community being filled with people standing in quarters with their hands crossed over their chest with opinions and we're not sure how to settle the matter yet. Sir, can a, can a photon go through different phases? Can it act like a particle, then a wave, then a particle again? That, that we know it can do. The right. argument is can it do both at the same time? And it's supposed to not be able to do both at the same time. It's supposed to pick. Either be a wave or be a particle, not both. Now, I don't know, did that answer, answer your question or is this a different experiment that you're talking about? Because you're talking about like a time frame, right? Yeah, it's a similar one. I think the, the, the Wheeler experiment was confirmed in a short scale and then somebody said, well, look, we can do this over, um, over with a galactic lens. You can, you can do it over a time scale that's a, a lot longer, which means that the, the, quest, the question sort of takes on an astronomical scale and it, it stretches the credibility or, or you know, the credulity even further. Um, yeah, so that's... But of course, but for photons, right, they don't experience any time. I right. Mean, from when they're created to when they, they're absorbed again, it could be billions of years and they don't experience any time. And uh, this is one of those cases where you have to start dealing with the can it do both? Um, because over those different distances, it's going to experience things that lensify it, that focus it, and things like that. So as far as I can tell, it continues to be proven true, but this other experiment is kind of looming over it, changing interpretations, maybe, but most people don't think so. That's <coughs> why I brought up the other experiment and confused everyone listening. Um, so, um, Moriel uh, Schottlander says that my biggest problem with the multiverse hypothesis is that it sounds like it's completely unfalsifiable. So you, you describe one test, maybe, but I, even that, I mean, I don't know what, if you like, were in a box and survived through what should have been the half-life decay of the, of the particle, 
you still would just think, well, maybe it was just a really random this is, chance. This is where, yeah, right? this is where you have to have it be multiple random chance. This is now at the point that this just should not have happened. Um, but even, but I mean, if there's a rare chance, then it could still happen. And, and that's the problem with the experiment, is, is at what point do you consider a rare chance as being impossible? So there is a chance that two people could have DNA that both uh, crop up as being identical even though they're not related. So in theory, I could have the exact same DNA pattern as someone else born in Europe that is in no way related to me, in theory. Now that's probably not going to happen and no court system would ever accept that concept in, in our modern understanding of using DNA for testimony. Um, but the possibility is still there. So at what point do you have the legal limit of something not being probable? And you can use that legal limit to say, I shouldn't still be alive. I must live in a multiverse. So uh, Kali Polky asks, uh, while quantum mechanics deals with probability distributions uh, with the talent decay, what makes scientists so sure there isn't an underlying deterministic machinery that the scientists just don't yet understand? Um, because all of the experiments that we look at are all described strictly by probabilities. Um, so it's one of these things of the mathematics. None of us wanted this probability stuff. This was not asked for science. This was a matter of having the horrible, terrible, not wanted realization of, oh, insert expletive of choice. This is the only way to get the equations to work. So it comes down to having exhausted every other possibility, we're left with probabilities. But could a deterministic universe emulate a probabilistic no. universe. No? no? No. No, if I, you know, if I know how every die is going to be rolled ahead of time and then I just roll the dice and they'll just show up the way I, I planned them, isn't that deterministic? So, so, so the issue is that in the universe we have now, if I knew the outcome of every single, okay, not the outcome, if I knew the state of every single atom in this universe in this moment, I could not use that data to tell you what the state would be in the next moment because their behaviors are determined by probabilities. So there's no way to say this atom, no matter how much information I have, is going to decay. All I can say is it has a probability of doing the following thing. There, there is no determinism. It's strictly, um, it might. It might. It might. Um, i got some tweets. Um, Siloneplex on the Twitters is uh, finding themselves uh, becoming hypnotized by listening to Pamela talk about Schrodinger's cat. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? You know what? I don't see a lot of questions. I don't see a lot of general astronomy questions. So, you know, this is how this works. You, we don't get the questions. If we don't get the interaction, then we just <laughs> shut this baby down. And that's that. Um, Cool. Well, we'll give it people a few more seconds. If anyone's got any more questions, any more questions in general about this, about CosmoQuest, about uh, Pamela's furniture rearrangement. <laughs> um, oh, we, we can, while you're all here, if you'd like to um, join us in the real world next Christmas to celebrate the world not ending, um, Fraser and I are going to be going on a The World Is Not Ending cruise through the Caribbean that will actually have us at Mayan Ruins on the fateful, non-fatal day. And you can sign up to be with us. All the information is at astrosphere.org. And um, I'll be tweeting it when the show is over. And we'd love to see you on the cruise ship with us. What's the difference between Astrosphere and CosmoQuest? I guess it's hard to explain all that, isn't it? Um, Astrosphere is a 501c3 nonprofit, and CosmoQuest owns nothing and is a partnership between Universe Today and Astrosphere and Southern Illinois University Edwardsville and other people that are all contributing content, contributing effort. And, and so you, you have organizations that funnel the money and the humans, and then you have the product that results, and CosmoQuest is the product that results. And it's Nicole! There's Nicole Galucci. Hi. One of the members of our weekly space hangout. Hey, Nicole. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good, We're where doing are you? great. I'm at home. Good. Woohoo! Yes, very exciting. 
Um, Did you have a, com a question or a, a, uh, a suggestion, an improvement? Uh, I, well, not, I kind of have a question, actually, for Pamela. Um, <laughs> so when I, I'm explaining the Schrodinger's cat um, concept to people, um, sometimes I get, well, is, does that really happen? I mean, is that really what happens? Um, and I'm not quite sure how to answer that, because it's like, well, if it's a particle, yes, that's how it really happens. But So, yeah. so the, the way I've mean? always had it described to me is if the wave function is larger than the physical object, then yes, you can have multiple states at the same time because the wave mm -hmm. functions are what are deciding everything. But as soon as the wave functions get smaller than the physical entity, then it just acts like a particle all the time or acts like a solid object all of the time. Right. So our wave functions are way, way smaller than we are. And you can Google it to figure out what, what size the wave function of a human being is. Yeah. This is why you don't see humans oscillating. Um, so as long as the wave function is smaller than the, in this case, critter, mm -hmm. um, as long as the wave function is smaller than the critter, you end up with it acting dead or alive with no uh, okay. convolved random wave states. So we've got a few more additions here. We've got Chris. Hey, Chris. Hi there, Fraser. Where are you calling from? Uh, Caerphilly, South Wales. Excellent. Perfect. Now now early in the morning there. Get, I was just trying to get the equipment working. I'm thinking up some decent questions, but I'm well, probably... You, you, ha you had one in the comments, though, so why don't we uh, take a crack at that one? Do you want to ask that one again? Yeah, yeah, I can do. Um, there's a lot of theories out there. The theories are kind of coming thick and fast. And I kind of wonder, at what point do we take all of these theories seriously? I mean, just because a theory can't be disproven, do we have to accept it? Do we have to put up with it? I mean, <laughs> is, there a, is there a potential problem here that we could have theory overload and we've got a lot of stuff out there that's actually masking the truth, the reality of, of what is going on in the universe? Is this a problem, do you think? So, so one of the things that, that Fraser and I came up with as a tagline for Astronomy Gast is a facts-based journey through the universe or the cosmos uh, telling you not only what we know but how we know it. And at one point we did a Q&A where we talked about the things that we weren't ever going to talk about because they can't be proven. Um, and, and at a certain point, that's what you have to do with theorists, is you have to say, dude, nice idea, I don't have to believe you because you have no evidence and no predictive abilities. That is some fancy math. Yeah, yeah. So string theory, no proof. I choose to uh, disavow myself of string theory. Um, and, and with a lot of these theories, since there is no evidence, since they have no predictive power, um, you are completely free to say, I know you exist as a theory out there. I don't need to believe in you because it is a belief system. Um, it's a belief system based on math. But in graduate school, one of the things we talked about is if you lock 10 theorists in a room, ask them a question, they'll come out with 20 theories that all perfectly answer the question and none of them have to be right. So no, yeah, feel, right, free, yeah. feel free to ignore all theories that a, have no predictive power, and B, aren't testable. But um, obviously at the same time, I mean, the many of the amazing discoveries, I mean, I guess some of the discoveries come from a crazy discovery, like dark energy, where astronomers were looking for one thing and they came up with something else. But there's lots of situations where a theorist makes a prediction and then that gives the observers you know, even something to even look for that they and, didn't and even occur to them to look for, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the key is there's plenty of good theorists out there who are doing good work that looks at the actual universe we're in and says, given this, this, and this, I predict the following. We may not have the technology right now to test the theory, but I predict the following. It's, it's the theories that somewhere in the paper say this isn't testable because, because it's not. Those are the theories. I, 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 life is too short to read all of those papers. Uh, so welcome, Dylan. Hi. So where are you? Where are you from? I'm from Nova Scotia. Another Nova Canadian. Scotia. Nice. Yeah. yeah. How's it going, eh? Uh, <laughs> everyone, all my friends always make fun of me when they say eh. Now you have really to have gone to the Bay of Fundy. Please tell me you and Nova Scotia have gone to the Bay of Fundy. I have. Okay then you're yeah. allowed to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Bay of Fundy is like the place with the highest tidal difference in the world. It's got to be yeah. Yeah. astonishing. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to yeah, see they that. Yeah, um, I went mudsliding there before. When the tides go down, you clear all the rocks. It's just 
straight mud all the way down. You can just jump in and slide down. Oh, wow. You that can actually awesome. watch rivers reverse directions as the tide yeah. changes directions with the yeah. tidal bore. That yeah. sounds really good. Okay, um, what's your question? Sorry, I'm, I'm promoting the Bay of Fundy for some random reason. Um, this episode brought to you by uh, Nova Scotia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I was wondering about uh, Transit of Venus. I was doing some research, and I was wondering, why is there like the 122 years, I think it was, and uh, eight years? What's the reason behind that? So, so what ends up happening is um, I need to have like a collection of Nerf balls on my yeah. desk, and Phil, I don't have that Phil right now. Phil would have them. I know. Phil, Phil is so much more on top of having the random props than I He can pull I out am. a model of the, of the Milky Way <laughs> in a heartbeat. So I'm, I'm trying to find... I have like nothing round. I, oh. I have something in front of me. I'm like, why can't I hand it through the computer to you? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go with the random round object here. And we'll pretend that this smaller round object is Venus. So normally, from the point of view of my camera, as Venus orbits around, it dips below the surface of the, uh, below the sphere of the sun and above the sphere of the sun, as viewed by my camera. Now, I could be somewhere else, and I could see Venus passing in front all the time. Now, the thing is, the, the orbit of Venus, it's tilted, and as this tilting orbit moves around, occasionally it lines up just right so that we have Earth, Venus, Sun on a line. And as Venus cuts across the Sun, um, we get to enjoy a show. And the way this works is you end up with a resonance that puts those points that cut in front of the Sun lined up with the Earth just right in this crazy resonance pattern. Um, it has to do with the tilt of the Earth and the tilt of Venus and the rate at which all of this goes and it's all highly confusing to try and explain without little models to step you through it over time but you have to trust me it's just a matter of they get close enough that you end up with on either side of, of the eight years you end up with a transit and then you have this huge gap um, one way to, to think about it is occasionally we'll get lucky and we'll end up with um, two partial solar eclipses on either side of a lunar eclipse. This doesn't happen very often, but it happens occasionally because of the fluke of how things line up. And it just happens to be with Venus. It's, you get this strange lining up of the nodes separated 